Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' play Electra. Now, <clears throat> Electra is a really interesting play because we have more surviving tragedies related to the Electra and Orestes story than any other story from ancient Greece. Um, so, I mean, one of the things about the Greek playwrights was they recycled the same material over and over and over from these great mythic families. Aristotle actually says this is this is the way that you approach tragedy. And so the house of Tantalus, uh, which includes Agamemnon, Clytemnestra, Orestes, and Electra, etc., etc., um, we have more we have more material about this more tragic material about this house than any other house we have um Aeschylus's the oristia particularly the libation bearers the middle play of that trilogy corresponds to what's going on in electra and then we have sophocles's electra which is of course the same the same storyline and then uh, we also have Euripides' play Orestes, which is about the same, the same myth cycle. But Euripides' Electra is interesting because it gives us a third very distinct take on the Electra story. So Aeschylus has his version, Sophocles has his version, which is much more cynical. And I, I did a video on this, and, and the thing that really struck me is that Sophocles highlights the ways in which every charge that Electra makes against Clytemnestra can also be made against Electra. Now, Euripides has that, that point as well, but it's not as central to his version. Instead, I would say Euripides gives us a more gritty, realistic type version, but also a version that satirizes some of the elements of earlier versions. So the basic storyline is the same. We start with Electra in, in uh, Mycenae, angry at her mother and Aegisthus for the murder of her father Agamemnon. What's different in Euripides' version is that she's married. So in, in both Aeschylus and Sophocles, Electra has just been sort of sequestered in the palace, but <clears throat> Euripides moves her outside the palace. And that's actually a really important point, and I'll come to that later on. But she's been married to a peasant. Now... Interestingly, this peasant is a pretty noble, down-to-earth dude. Uh, like, he gives us the prologue, and basically he gives us a... He starts by giving us a little bit of background on uh, the murder of Agamemnon, the exile of Orestes, uh, who was a baby at the time, uh, as, we, as we learn. I'll come back to that, because that's an important... That's not an important point, but it's a point that bothers me. Um, so this peasant says, But the girl Electra stayed on in her father's house, and in the first delicate bloom of her youth was courted by suitors, princely men from all over Helos. Aegisthus, nervous that she might bear one of these a son who one day would avenge the murdered king, kept her closeted, well out of sight, well out of the sight of any bridegroom. This, however, did not rid him of his fear, and terrified she might secretly bear a child, he made up his mind to kill her. But her mother, cold-hearted woman that she was, saved her from Aegisthus. Killing her husband was one thing, killing children quite another. Aegisthus then alighted on another plan. He offered a prize in gold to anyone who could kill Agamemnon's son who had fled the land. That's Orestes, by the way. Meanwhile, giving me Electra as my wife. Well, I am a true-bred Mycenaean, and though a poor man by no means ignoble. Nobility, however, does not cancel poverty. Aegisthus abated his anxiety by giving her to a nobody, knowing that if a man of power married her, the murder of Agamemnon would be roused 
from his slumber, and heavy retribution fall on Aegisthus' head. Here let me make quite clear, with Aphrodite as my witness, that not once have I taken advantage of her bed. She is a virgin still. I would count it a disgrace to deflower the child of a noble house. I am so far beneath her by birth. But I blush for Orestes as if he were my brother, should he ever come to Argos and look upon his sister's humiliating marriage. In the eyes of many I may be a fool, taking a young girl into my house and not touching her. Such a one provides a prurient yardstick by which he should himself be measured, and is exactly what he thinks of me. So, first off, this peasant, super good guy. Um... He has gone along with Aegisthus's attempt to destroy, delegitimize Electra, but he's done it in such a way that he, in fact, preserves Electra's standing. Um, and, and he lends her his support in her quest to seek revenge. Now, uh, pretty much the first thing that happens. So Electra uh, comes in, they have a bit of a chat, she goes in, uh, into the cottage, and then Orestes and, and his friend Pylades, who never speaks, who almost never speaks in any of the versions, I think over the four or five plays in which he appears, he gets like three lines, maybe. Um, so Orestes and Pylades show up, and Orestes says... This is the first bit where where the theory that Orestes was sent into exile as a baby bothers me. He says, You know, Pylades, in loyalty and love I count you my dearest comrade. Of all Orestes' friends, you are the only one who stood by me in my ordeal when the foul Aegisthus and my evil and my ever evil mother slew my father. You were a baby. Who what friend was being like, yes, I will I will stand by your side to avenge this evil 18 years or so from now when you're an adult. No, no, I don't, it, I don't accept it. It doesn't make, the timeline doesn't make any sense. So there's that element of it. There's also the element of Orestes is supposed to be Agamemnon and Clytemnestra's child, right? Agamemnon was at the Trojan War for 10 years. Then he comes home, day one, dead. So, how did Clytemnestra have his baby? Mm, the timeline doesn't work out there. I mean, even if she'd gotten pregnant the last night before Agamemnon left, Orestes would still be nine-plus years old by the time Agamemnon gets back. He wouldn't be a baby. So, I don't know. But set that aside, that's, that's consistently a problem in the Orestes stories. He's always described as having been a baby, and he always is described as Agamemnon's son. The math doesn't work out. But, leave that aside. Uh, so basically, then Orestes decides. So he sees Electra, uh, who is who looks just like a peasant, and he's like, "Oh, I'll ask this peasant if Electra's around somewhere." Uh, which he does first by hiding, um, and then Electra's basically like going along, singing a song like, "Hey, I'm Electra. I hate my mother." She mur murdered my dad, and I'm sad. It's a, I mean, it's a more downbeat song than that hand gesture made it seem like it is. But basically, she, like, sings this song about her tribulations, and Orestes from his hiding place is like, aha, that's Electra. At which point he confronts her and doesn't tell her who he is. He confronts her and pretends to be a friend of Orestes, bringing tidings of him and trying to find out on his behalf what's going on in Mycenae. Which goes on a long time. Like, he spends he spends a substantial amount of time with Electra, even getting invited into this peasant's cottage to have a meal, 
without revealing who he is. And there's no clear reason why he does this. Like, he, do, he doesn't... He never says, hey, Pylades, I'm gonna trick Electra, and here's the reasoning for that. He just does it, and it's it's a sort of pointless, arbitrary thing. Except that it's necessary for Euripides' satire of the recognition scene. So, this is actually one of the most famous bits from Euripides' Electra because it's directly a satire on the, rep the recognition scene in Aeschylus. So, in Aeschylus's The Libation Bearers, Orestes comes to the tomb of Agamemnon, he cuts a lock of his hair and leaves it as a sort of sacrifice for the dead, he leaves a footprint, um, and he's got some cloth that uh, Electra had woven for him when he was a baby. Um, then Electra comes, and she sees the hair, and she's like, hey, that hair is exactly like my hair. Oh, here's a footprint. My foot fits exactly in it. And then when Orestes comes out, she's like, hey, I recognize that cloth that I wove for you as a baby. Euripides takes this apart. Um, so in this version, the old tutor who had spirited Orestes out of Mycenae when when Agamemnon was murdered comes to Electra's cottage and he's basically like hey I stopped off at your dad's tomb and I found this hair you should check it against your hair um and Electra's like that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard like Orestes is a guy. He's spent his life outside and doing, I don't know, wrestling and fighting and whatever it is. His hair would not look like my hair. Incidentally, Are Euripides repeatedly refers to uh, Electra as having a shaved head or shorn hair. So it's not even clear that she has that much hair to compare it with. But uh, she's like, yeah, his hair would not look like my hair. Plus, um, a lot of people who are not actually related have similar hair. And then the tutor's like, oh, well, why don't you try putting your foot in his footprint and see if they're the same? And she's like, but that's dumb, too, because first off, the ground is rocky, so there's not going to be a footprint, because this is Greece, and we, we have rocks. Second off, uh, it's almost certain that a man's foot would be bigger than my foot anyway, so that, like... It, they're not going to be the same. That's a terrible way to figure it out. And then the tutor's like, oh, does he have any sort of cloth that you wove for him as a baby that you could recognize him from? And Electra's like, first off, I was a little kid when Orestes was taken, so the idea that I was weaving him cloth, like, you, don't, you clearly don't know kids, even though you've raised a bunch of them as a tutor. Second off, if I wove him cloth as a baby, he would not still be able to wear that clothing as an adult. Like, the notion that he would have that doesn't make any sense. So we get that whole sort of recognition, we get that whole sort of recognition theme from Aeschylus deconstructed and basically shown to be ridiculous. But then Euripides gives us an equally ridiculous recognition scene because the tutor... So Orestes comes out of the, the cottage, and the tutor's like, oh, I'm going to look at this guy, and I'll circle around him and check him out, and whatever it is. And then he declares that this is Orestes. Electra says, how can I believe you? What evidence do you offer? The tutor says, the scar on his eyebrow from a fall long ago when chasing a fawn with you in your father's palace. First off, he was a baby when he left. So the idea that, I mean, maybe he was a toddler and he was like toddling along after a deer, but I don't know. Um, and then Electra says, are you sure I don't see the mark of a fall? So that's a really interesting one because the tutor says, yeah, he's got a scar on his eyebrow. And Electra's like, yeah, he doesn't have a scar on his eyebrow. But then the tutor's like, but still hesitant to... Uh, but still hesitate to run into his arms. 
And then Electra says, no, 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 old man, I am convinced. Like, she, she's convinced by evidence that she's just been like, yeah, I don't see that evidence. That's not, that's clearly not something that's actually going on. So it is this weird recognition scene, and I, I think it is Euripides just sort of thumbing his nose at some of these conventions. Because actually, in a lot of plays, we have a recognition. Even in Ion, even in Euripides' play Ion, we have that idea of like, oh, that's the basket that you were abandoned in with some stuff. I recognize that stuff. Therefore, I recognize that you're my child. So, I mean, we got that as a, as a sort of generic convention in Greek tragedy and Greek myth. And Euripides here, I think, is mocking it very justifiably uh, as being sort of nonsense. But anyway, they hatch this plot. So she accepts that Orestes is Orestes, and he's like, yeah, it's me, fair cop. Um, so they ha hatch this plan. Um, and this is actually where the idea of taking the action out of the palace becomes really significant, because Aegisthus has gone to a field to sacrifice a bull to honor the nymphs. He's brought some slaves, but he hasn't really brought guards per se. And so they decide that Orestes is going to go and kill him in this field. Which, if you consider that Arrest, er, that um, Clytemnestra and Aegisthus are paranoid about uh, Orestes returning to murder them, it seems unlikely that Orestes would be able to sneak into the palace and murder them because there would like when you have the when you have paranoid rulers they have lots of guards around so the idea that he could get to them in the palace doesn't make that much sense but if Aegisthus has gone into a field to make a sacrifice it would be much easier to get to him. So this is one of the ways in which marrying Electra to this peasant works out well for Euripides. So he does that. He uh, Orestes goes and he kills Aegisthus in a field. They bring his body back to the cottage, hide it in the cottage. Um, and Electra has sent word to Clytemnestra that she's just had a baby, and so she needs Clytemnestra to come and do some rituals and things. Interestingly enough, Orestes becomes really reluctant to kill Clytemnestra, which, I mean, realistically makes sense because um, it's matricide. Like, typically people don't look forward to murdering their mother, even if their mother murdered their father. Um, But Orestes even sort of questions the wisdom of Apollo's oracle. He says, Apollo, what a blunder your oracle has made. So we get this, this sort of recognition that he's about to do something problematic. And um, so he, he even sort of acknowledges he will be branded a matricide and, and there will be a negative outcome of this. But Electra convinces him to go through with it. Then after Clytemnestra arrives and they murder her, they both sort of have second thoughts about this. Um, but then, interestingly enough, we have a deus ex machina at the end. Castor and Pollux, although only Castor speaks. Um, so Castor and Pollux were heroes, and they, when they died... Uh, they ascended to join the gods. Um, they were also the brothers of uh, Helen and and um, Clytemnestra. So Castor and Pollux show up at the end, and they're basically... So the, the thing that I find... One of the things I find most striking about them, Castor says, Her punishment was just, but you did wrong. And Phoebus Apollo, ah, Phoebus Apollo but I can't say a thing against my king. He may be wise, but this oracle for you was not. We must accept and you must do whatever Zeus and fate lay out for you. 
So here we get an interesting sort of sense of the gods as contradictory figures, because Castor doesn't agree with Apollo's oracle, which told Orestes to go and kill Clytemnestra. Um, but Castor also does seem Castor also seems to be of two minds of it, because he says her punishment was just, but you did wrong. So you did the right thing, but you did the wrong thing. So we have this paradox here. And then Orestes has to suffer the punishment for doing the thing that Apollo and implicitly Zeus and the Fates laid out for him. So he had to kill Clytemnestra because that was what fate and the gods required. But now he has to suffer the penalty for doing it. Interestingly enough, Electra gets off much easier because Pylades, he, she becomes Pylades' husband, apparently just forgetting the fact that she's married to a peasant already. Um, so she becomes Pylades' wife, and um, so, I mean, Pylades, it's a win-win for him because he's not guilty of matricide and he gets a wife. Um, so, I mean, there's that element of it. But then the other interesting thing about Castor's speech, he says, uh, The people of Argos will cover the body of Aegisthus in a tomb. As to your mother, Menelaus, who recently arrived in Nauplia from Troy, will bury her, he and Helen. Helen, who never went to Troy, but has just come home from Proteus's palace in Egypt. It was Zeus who sent a phantom Helen to Ilium, for he wanted strife and slaughter among mankind. So again, this is a very famous bit from Euripides, this sort of defense of Helen type approach. And there, there are other sort of traditions in which Helen is, does not actually go to Troy. She, in fact, goes to uh, Egypt or to somewhere else. And there's a fake Helen who goes to Troy. So the whole Trojan War becomes pointless. Um, but the thing that's interesting about the way Euripides treats it here is it's really just mentioned in passing. Like, it doesn't serve any dramatic function in this play other than for Castor just to be like, yeah, everybody who died in the Trojan War died for nothing. Sorry. But the last thing I want to talk about in terms of um, Euripides' sort of cynicism in this is... The idea of hubris, because hubris is central to Greek tragedy. Um, so when Orestes has killed Aegisthus, he comes back, and Electra's basically like, yay, you're like a god. And Orestes is like, but, uh, and she's like, um, da, 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 except for my hands, this wreath, etc., etc. So, and then Orestes is like, but first Electra salute the gods, the authors of this outcome, then praise me. I'm only the pawn of fate and heaven who would in a battle of, uh, uh, who have in a battle of deeds, not words, destroyed Aegisthus. So all should know it, I bring you the corpse itself. Expose it, if you will, for beasts to ravage, or impale it on a stake for vultures to rend. He is your chattel now, once called your king. So here we have a couple of interesting things. Um, the first is this sort of giving credit to the gods, which is a good non-hubristic move on Orestes' part. He says, hey, I just did what the gods put in motion, which of course is good because he's not sort of adopting overweening pride of like, I am the greatest fighter. I have conquered Aegisthus through my own might. The gods can go fuck themselves, etc., etc., which we see in other places. And it always ends badly. Um, but then we have a shift where he's like, yeah, you don't even need to bury Aegisthus's corpse. Don't even worry about it. Just leave it out. Which as we saw in a play like, Sophocles' is Antigone is a no-no. This is a bad decision. So there's that. Um, and Electra even says, gloating over the dead invites reprisals. So again, the same thing we saw in Antigone. 
But Orestes says, you are blameless, no one can find fault. And Electra says, but the city and our people are garrulous and censure prone. So that's a really interesting shift again, because in, Ag er, in Antigone, it's we can't leave this corpse out because the gods oppose it. It is contrary to divine law. We get the implication of that here when Electra says uh, disrespecting the dead invites reprisals, but then we quickly shift away from that like the gods don't like this to the people in this town are gossips and and they're gonna they're gonna be mean to us if we do this. So again, we have that sort of Euripidean cynicism here um, in a really interesting way that complicates a story that we see in dramatically different forms from Aeschylus and Sophocles. <laughs> 